Hey guys, what is up? This is Cam Jennings, aka Cam Fats, coming at you all on behalf of the Cam Fats YouTube channel. Hope you guys are doing amazing out there on this fine, fine Sunday afternoon. Uh, CERN shut down 2019. In case you didn't know, CERN was in a period of shutdown right now for upgrades. And uh, you might wonder, what does CERN have to do with the Mandela Effect? I know you've probably seen it out there before, people speculating on what's causing the Mandela Effect. And, you know, one of the theories was something to do with CERN. But it's, it gets a little hokey when you start going down that rabbit hole. You start finding all these weird, you know, fan fictions and uh, just out-of-this-world stories that don't really make sense. And it's, it's kind of like it's really hard to separate what might be true from a bunch of nonsense, you know. So um, what you're looking at right here uh, is a timeline that I put together personally uh, for my own knowledge uh, when it comes to CERN and how it relates to the Mandela Effect. Um, and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, let me just go ahead and... Uh, Hold on a second, guys. We can actually use it like this. Not even a big deal. Um, okay, so I wanted to share this with you uh, because... This is um, a timeline of events for uh, CERN and some things related to it. And as I think, it relates to the Mandela Effect. I put this timeline together for myself, um, but I think that after we go through this together, you guys are going to see um, why I believe this is, you know... There's definitely something here, you know. I, I can't, I can't say for sure because I, I'm not a physicist, you know. But I definitely see some relation, and I think that after you guys go through this with me, you're gonna see the relation too. Okay, so let's just go through this timeline a little bit. It makes me mad that I can't get this to full screen, uh, but that's okay. Um, I'm using a free uh, timeline creator here called Time Graphics. Pretty cool tool. Uh, pre pretty neat little tool. Um, but anyways, um, so this is where it starts, right? Uh, in truth, it actually begins way back here uh, in 1959. Like a way back here, right? This is when CERN opens up in 1954, 64 years ago. Uh, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, known as CERN, is a, is a European research organization that operates the la largest part particle physical physics laboratory in the world. Established in 1954, the organization is based in a northwest suburb of Geneva on the Franco-Swiss border and has 22 member states. All right, cool. So that was way back then. It actually started with 12. Okay, but this is when things really start to heat up. We move forward um, several years, right, um, to uh, 19, 1998 is when uh, CERN begins building the LHC, the, the Large Hadron Collider. So it's the world's largest and most powerful particle collider. Um, you know, it, it was built by the European Organization for Nuclear Research. I don't want to go too far into this because most of you probably already know about this. Um, but I just want to kind of skim a little bit for the people who don't know. Basically, the, the LHC attempts to study elementary particles and the ways they interact. Researchers have used it to learn about quantum physics, and they hope to learn much more about the structure of space and time. The, the observations researchers are able to make... Uh, can help us learn what the universe might have been like within milliseconds after the Big Bang. The Large Hadron Collider accelerates these particles through the tunnel until they reach nearly the speed of light. Different protons are directed through the tunnel in opposite directions. When they collide, they create conditions similar to the early universe. Um, so this is 
this is the Large Hadron Collider. It basically collides um, protons together, and what it does is, is it creates the same kind of environment that would have been there when the universe was first formed uh, on a micro level. Um, and in doing this, they're able to like discover uh, new kinds of, uh, you know, new kinds of. They're able to unlock secrets of of the universe basically you know, and that's how they discovered the you know the Higgs boson uh, particle or the so-called God particle um, and that's how they discovered they, they discovered a lot of things from this from this LHC so anyways they begin building it in 1998 though okay so in uh, 2004 or in 2003 <clears throat> they release they released the first safety report on the LHC, and and the reason they released this in in 2003 is because they're starting to get some criticism on it. There's a lot of people that are getting scared about the LHC. They're afraid um, that they're afraid that you know CERN might open up you know black holes. <laughs> they're afraid that you know, this, this large hadron collider might actually open up micro black holes small black holes that they could grow in size and somehow cause a catastrophic event in the world there's a lot of people that are afraid of that right so CERN releases their first safety report on the LHC in 2003 all right the safety of high energy particle collision was a topic of widespread discussion and topical interest during the time when relativistic heavy ion collider that was uh, another collider that was before uh, the LHC and later the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. Uh, currently the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator were being constructed and commissioned. So concerns arose that such high energy ex ex experiments designed to produce novel particles and forms of matter had the potential to create harmful states of matter or even doomsday scenarios. To address these concerns, in the context of the LHC, CERN mandated a group of independent scientists to review these scenarios. In a report issued in 2003, they concluded that like current particle experiments such as the RHIC, the LHC particle collisions pose no conceivable threat. Now, I do want to point something out here, guys. Um, they commissioned um, a group of scientists to review the scenarios. Okay, so when you when you commission uh, when you commission a group of scientists, you pay them. All right, you pay them. So CERN paid these scientists. Okay, so that means these scientists were were paid to produce a certain kind of result. They were looking for a certain kind of result. That result was this is perfectly safe. All right, um, I, I, you need to understand that. Okay. It should. It says independent, right? CERN mandated a group of independent scientists to review these scenarios. But what you got to understand is, um, you can only be so independent when you're being paid by someone to do a study. You know, so I mean, just keep it in mind. You know, if if uh, you know Jiffy Peanut Butter pays a, a group of scientists to you know examine you know the health benefits of Jiffy Peanut Butter, then you know, it, there's a good chance that the, the results are going to be favorable to Jiffy Peanut Butter, okay? <laughs> because if they're not favorable, then you're never going to see that report. It's never going to see the light of day. So anyways, just keep that in mind. Uh, that was in 2003, okay? In 2008, CERN finishes construction of the LHC, all right? Right? Also, at the same time in 2008, uh, CERN releases a second safety report on the LHC, right? This was 11 years ago. All right. A second review of the evidence commissioned in CERN was released in 2008. The report prepared by a group of physicists affiliated to CERN but not involved in the LHC experiments reaffirmed the safety of the LHC collisions in light of further research conducted since the 2003 assessment. Did you see that? Now they come out and just openly admit it. The report prepared by a group of physicists affiliated to CERN but not involved in the LHC experiments. They're affiliated to CERN. When you, you say someone's affiliated to CERN, we're, we're talking about money here. We're talking about money. These, these, these physicists, these affiliate, these physicists um, were in some way, shape, or form being paid by CERN. Okay, so that's what it means when you're affiliated with something. 
So anyways, um, they reaffirmed the safety of the LHC collisions in light of the further research conducted. Okay, so so the point is these safety reports, um, they're biased. The, the safety, the two safety reports were biased towards CERN uh, to really, really push the project through. Right? The report ruled out any doomsday scenario at the LHC, noting that the physical conditions and collision events which exist in LHC, RHIC also, and other experiments that occur naturally and routinely in the universe without hazardous consequences, including ultra-high energy cosmic rays, observed to impact Earth with energies far higher than those in any man-made collider. Right, so guys, I'm just basically giving you little snippets of articles I read, and I understand some of this reading is dry. It's a little dry, but but you know that's why I had to make a timeline so that I could see uh, everything together because there's a lot of information out there, um, and it's in um, like public archives and uh, and science journals and stuff. Like this particular one came from uh, actually it came from uh, an old article from CERN, right? Uh, this website is no longer maintained. It contains it, it, its content may be obsolete. <laughs> so, but this is um, this is from this article right here. But anyways, uh, so they really they uh, they finished construction on that. They released a second safety report um, that was in January of two thousand eight. Right now, if we move forward to uh, we move forward to um, August of 2008, there's a legal bid to stop CERN Atom Smasher from destroying the world, right? Critics of the Large Hadron Collider. See, this is the thing, and you don't you don't hear about this, but this is the thing. Um, this whole time, they put out these two safety reports to combat all these all this criticism of, of the collider, right? So, um, critics of the Large Hadron Collider, a 4.4 billion euro machine due to be switched on in 10 days um, so you saw you know earlier that year they finished construction on it it was at this at this point in August it was due to be turned on in 10 days right um, they've lodged a lawsuit at the European Court for Human Rights against the 20 countries including the UK that fund the project the device is designed to replicate conditions that exist just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, and its creators hope it will unlock the secrets of how the universe began. However, opponents fear the machine, which will smash pieces of atoms together at high speeds and generate, um, and it's actually not atoms, it's subatomic particles, uh, which is interesting. Um, Generate temperatures of more than a trillion degrees centigrade may create a mini black hole that could tear the Earth apart. That's what they're worried about. They're worried about this thing creating mini black holes, micro black holes. Scientists involved in the project have dismissed the fears as absurd and insist that the extensive safety assessments on the 17 mile long particle accelerator have demonstrated that it is safe. The legal battle comes as the European Nuclear Research Center CERN in Geneva prepares to send the first beam of particles around the machine at the office uh, the official switch on on September 10th although it will be several weeks before the particle the first particles are collided together this came from the Telegraph UK news um, so that was a legal bid that was in uh, August right and into August and uh, let me just let me let me make this a little bit It was a legal bid to stop them in uh in, in August of two thousand eight. It moved forward um to to two thousand nine, right? Let's move forward a year to two thousand nine. Um another uh astrophysicist, uh Rainier Plaga, he publishes a paper on risks of micro black holes from LHC, right? On tenth of August two thousand eight, well this is around the same time. Um, he posted a research paper. I, I don't know why I put this a year later. This was actually a year before I was doing this late. Uh, but, uh, it was actually around the same time that lawsuit was filed, but he published his paper, um, talking about the dangers, um, basically saying, he's basically saying here, uh, exclusion of black hole, uh, disaster scenario at the LHC, uh, which relies on a number of new arguments to conclude that there's no risk due to many black holes at the LHC. Um, 
No, no, he did it. He did it in 2009. I'm sorry. I'm reading it wrong. Um, he was talking about the report they put out in 2008, the safety report they put out in 2008. Uh, he felt like it was wrong. He felt like it was not complete. Now, I'll show you Rainier's paper that he put out in 2009 saying there are risks to this. You guys, he's basically saying you guys put this safety report out. It was incomplete and it's, it's biased towards the LHC. It's not telling the whole story. Right, it's basically what he's saying. Now, the the funny thing about this is, um, Plaga updated his paper on the archive on 26th of September 2008, and again on 9th of August 2009. So far, Plaga's paper has not been published in a peer-reviewed journal. Why? Why has Plaga? He's an astrophysicist. They wouldn't give him the time of day. They would not give him the time of day. They would not publish it on a peer-reviewed journal. This is that paper, though, um, and I'm going to show you. Hey, I don't expect you to, you know, you can read this on your own time. I'll give you a link to my timeline. Um, it's a public timeline, so you can go look at it if you want. But it's 19 pages, and it's it's a really dry read. Um, but Plaga, this is really interesting around page 13, because around page 13 is when he's updating it. And he, see, so what happens is when he puts his paper out, um, CERN scientists and they get a bunch of other really really well uh, really credited scientists and this is their thing whenever people um, try to raise concerns about the LHC they always discredit them they always uh, point to their credentials or they always point to you know this and that they're very defensive um, and they always dismiss dismiss this kind of stuff but if you um but if we look down here uh, to page 13. I thought this was really interesting. Uh, right here he says, GM, GNM further proposed that I quote from an abstract of a talk by W. Period UNRWA in addition to the references of my paper. I hereby accept their suggestion. An excerpt from the UNRWA's abstract reads, He's basically, what he's basically doing here, and it's hard to understand it, it's hard without context, but if you read this whole thing, he's basically defending his original paper um, that they tried to tear apart. Um, but but he, he, um, he actually does quote an, ab uh, an abstract of a talk by UNRWA, and he quotes it right here. He kind, of, he kind of flips it back on him, and he says, Black hole evaporation is one of the most puzzling features of gravity and quantum theory. The derivation by Hawking is nonsense and that it uses features of the theory in regimes where we know the theory is wrong. Analog models of gravity have given us a clue that despite the shaky derivation, the effect is almost certainly right. Where then are the particles of black hole evaporation really created? So, so what he's basically saying is, um, you know, these... Uh, miniature black holes um they, they actually are being formed you know you know and, and CERN knows they're being formed they're kind of like dismissing it as not that big of a deal and they evaporate within seconds but you know if you if you do the research you'll see in the beginning of this whole thing back in 2003 2004 they weren't even really admitting the micro black holes were being formed and then here we are in 2008 2009 they are admitting micro black holes are being formed however um, there's not any real risk they evaporate almost immediately uh, based on um, Hawking's uh, Hawking rate the Hawking radiation uh, theory so what it's called um, and I'm not gonna get into all what that is you know I'm not gonna teach you guys to be rocket scientists or astrophysicists in 10 minutes uh, and I'm not one myself um, I can barely grasp some of these concepts but I'm not stupid enough to not see the relation of what I'm going to be showing you. Um, so anyways, uh, the point what he's trying to make here is, hey, look, these miniature black holes you guys are creating, they're unpredictable. They, they are unpredictable. You don't know what all they, they can do. All right. That's basically what he's saying in this report. Um, and he says it in a lot of different ways because these guys are really, really good at discrediting you. So anyways, um, the, this report is absolutely... Um, blacklisted it doesn't get put in any peer-to-peer -peer journals uh, it's basically not taken seriously right so that's that okay Plaga publishes that uh, that was in August of 2009 that was his last update on the report in August 2009 um, 
he published this actually right around the time they started. Uh, they finished work on it, and we're getting ready to turn it on. He kept on updating it for a year. Um, he couldn't get in any peer-to-peer -peer journals, though. Um, so a few a few months later, in November of 2009, um, they're criticized again, right? November 2009, with CERN Particle Physics Lab due to start shooting particles around its Large Hadron Collider again this month, and the first particle collisions expected in December Anti-LHC campaigners are on the warpath again. A new group calling itself the Committee on CERN Experimental Dangers will submit a complaint on November 3rd in the next few days. Um, some physicists have suggested that the extreme high energy the collisions that will take place in LHC could create postulated entities including many black holes and stranglets. strangelets. Critics say that the tiny black holes could swallow up the Earth or that strangelets could convert all matter into strange matter. Now, guys, I tried to figure out what strangelets were and, like, what, what that would actually mean to, like, the, the macro world if, if matter was converted into strange matter. And the, the, best I could, the best I could understand was kind of a doomsday scenario. Um, but in truth, I don't really understand what that means. But I, I'm really kind of focused on this miniature black hole thing uh, because I think it's relevant to what I want to share with you guys. But anyways, um, this was in 2009, and the point that I'm trying to um, make here is that there was a lot of opposition um, to CERN, you know. But it but it got you know pushed through, and the opposition got squashed down, and you know it's crazy. Anyways, uh, leading physicists who have studied the matter say that well-established principles all but guarantee that neither ca ca uh, catastrophe would occur. The black holes would quickly decay back to back into the particles that collided to create them. To pull in positively charged nuclei, strangelets would have and maintain a negative electric charge even as they gobble up the nuclei, which would violate conservation of charge. CERN has commissioned several safety reviews employing internal and external scientists and found the risk to be so small as to be not worth more delay. The main argument in these reviews has been that collision of similar energies happen daily in the upper atmosphere of cosmic rays slam into, at into atoms in the air, and so far Earth has survived unscathed. So <clears throat> that was their argument. I was on sciencemag.org. Um, Basically, what I'm trying to say here, guys, is that CERN has received a lot of opposition, and um, you know they've always met it with you know se severe defense. They're really good at getting their way. Basically, they have a lot of support behind them. There's a lot of countries behind them, so you know you're you're not going to be able to go to go to toe to toe with CERN um, and just automatically get. Um, you know, get hurt. You're probably not even going to get heard, you know, because basically they won't take you seriously unless you have all the, you know, credentials, you know, unless you're, unless you're a freaking astrophysicist, you know, anything you write or say is just going to be discredited You're as you're a buffoon. You don't know what you're talking about. And when astrophysicists come to talk and say anything negative about them, they're going to be like, well, you know, you're just talking about general relativity. You're not talking about the specifics of how things work inside the LHC. So it's it's really funny um, how they can get away with it like this. Um, you know, commissioning their own group of scientists for the safety report. I mean, that should be done by an outside party that has nothing to do with them. Uh, a a non-biased party that's not paid by them. I just don't understand how they even get away with it. It's amazing. Anyways, um, doesn't matter. Um, they got criti they got criticism in 2009, but by 2010, um, we got a lawyer's view of the risk of black hole catastrophe at CERN right here. So even more criticism, right? This was January 22nd, at the beginning of 2010. All right, just bringing up the topic of the Large Hadron Collider creating a black hole that destroys the Earth might seem unscientific, out of place on a science news website. After all, the subject is generally considered to be out of place in particle physics community, since peer-reviewed studies have shown that there is no significant risk of an LHC doomsday scenario. However, you guys know that any studies that say um, there is a significant risk of a doomsday scenario 
it's getting blacklisted and won't be put in peer-reviewed studies. It won't be put in there. Why would they not put it in there? It's amazing. Anyways, but right or wrong, many people continue to voice their concerns about AHC's potential to produce a worldwide catastrophe. Some of these concerns clearly go overboard, stemming stemmed by the fear and by stemmed by fear and ignorance. See, this is the kind of this is physicist.org who who wrote this paper. So it's 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 a very biased paper, right? So there's a lot of push um, for LHC and for CERN um, to do what it's doing. Um, is it possible for some someone outside the physics community to analyze the LHC's risk of producing uh, an Earth-swallowing black hole in a rational way? <clears throat> and this this goes on. And uh, Eric E. Johnson an assistant professor of law at the University of North Dakota has undertaken this task in a legal point of view. He has recently published a paper in the Tennessee Law Review in which he investigates how the courts might handle an LHC case and other future cases of largely unprecedented, potentially dangerous sci-fi-like experiments. So this is this article is kind of mocking him a little bit. It's kind of mocking uh, uh, this lawyer Johnson. All right. So the 90 page paper is highly readable for non scientists and is available at our, it's arxiv.org. Johnson, who admits that he is unanxious about a doomsday scenario, has two reasons for writing the paper. First, to present a kind of case study for debate among lawyers, and second, to prepare to solve such a legal case in real life. So they're really dismissing it as this paper doesn't really mean anything you know that's basically what they're kind of saying even the reasons he wrote it uh, he they act like he doesn't have a dog in the fight and he doesn't really care he just wrote it you know because you know because uh you know it's, it's a debate among lawyers and to prepare for such a legal case in real life but it was like a like a like this is pretend i'm just doing this as an exercise right so they're kind of just discrediting what he wrote but let me tell you something it's a 90 page paper Okay, and I like how they they um I like how they uh discredit his credentials right here by saying it's highly readable for non scientists. <laughs> um. Anyways, uh, in his paper, Johnson begins with an overview of the background of the LHC. Um. I what I wanted to point out here um. <sighs> While very few particle physicists have challenged the orth orthodoxy of Hawking radiation, the theory does have a few outside critics. Johnson highlights a few of these critics, including chaos theoretician Otto Rosler, who calculated that LHC produced black holes that might grow fast enough that the world might end slightly more than five years after the LHC's first full energy collisions. Although CERN physicists didn't respond directly to Rosler's shocking argument, media and citizen inquiries regarding LHC safety prompted CERN to set up the LHC safety assessment group. In a paper written in 2008, Mangano, a CERN employee, and Giddings, who accepted a future posi visiting position at CERN, turned to the cosmic ray argument rather than the Hawking radiation argument, which was becoming less persuasive. However, they found that black holes produced by cosmic rays could potentially slip through the Earth, which is made mostly of empty space while black holes produced by the LHC could remain in the vicinity for a long time, slowly gaining mass. Looking deeper into the universe, the physicists found that a kind of white dwarf star, eight of which have been observed, could likely hold black holes for a long time, so their continued existence must serve as living as evidence that the LHC is safe. So, it's a lot to unpack, you guys, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, what they're basically saying is, Hey, listen, this kind of stuff happens naturally all the time. So clearly what we're doing here is not going to cause any problems. Now, Johnson said while researching the subject, he was surprised at the legitimate science controversy surrounding the crazy sounding idea of black holes destroying the earth. He's basically saying he was surprised at the legitimate science controversy uh, surrounding crazy idea. So it sounds crazy, but he was surprised at actually finding, you know, Fire, where there was smoke. That's basically what he's saying. He was surprised by actually finding fire where there was smoke. Many of the physicists quoted in the media on LHC safety issues seemed not to have engaged with the literature in any depth, Johnson told physorg.com. 
Physicists speaking to the public about the black hole question portray it as a simple matter. It really is not. At the end of the day, the LHC may or may not be safe, but most of the arguments you hear in favor of the collider lack robustness. So I, I wanted to point this article out because he's talking about it from a lawyer standpoint, and I want to point it out just for one simple fact. He's very good at seeing um, when things are being uh, glossed over or when things are uh, biased towards one thing or an another, and that's what he's saying here. Um, the the LHC may or may not be safe, but most of the arguments you hear in favor of the collider lack robustness. He's saying that the things that are saying that this is safe are not really complete. They don't, they're not really telling the whole story. They're telling a one-sided story. And that's what I thought was interesting about what Johnson was saying in his report that he put out in 2010. Okay. Um, but nevertheless, um, in 2010, a few months later, uh, that was in January, a few months later, uh, CERN begins running tests with LHC, March 2010, all right? First data-taking period lasts from March 2010 to early 2013. And inter I'm not going to go into this stuff because no, none of us are going to know what it means anyway. Um, but it's about four times the previous world record for a collider and accelerator, right? Uh, it's the most powerful one, the biggest one in the world, so that's no surprise. Afterward, the accelerator was taken offline and upgraded over the course of two years. So they ran it for three years, okay? They begin in 2010, all right? They run it, they run it until 2013, but in that time, the LHC lawsuit, that, that lawsuit that was filed against them was dismissed, right? The Hawaiian man's lawsuit tried to prevent operations of the Large Hauldron Collider had been dismissed due to a failure to show credible threat of harm, according to the judge. And, as ruled in 2008, the judge against, again concluded that the U.S. government is not the correct party to bring the suit again against since the U.S. doesn't control LHC operations. However, I do want to point out that in 2008, uh, the U.S. was um, did hold observer privileges at CERN, okay? So even though, um, you know, the government's not the correct party to bring the suit against, um, the, the government does have a dog in the fight, okay? They are affiliated with that project, okay? Walter Wagner, a retired nuclear safety officer, um, journalist, filed a lawsuit in March uh, before the LHC was turned on. So, as a collaboration among thousands of scientists from more than 100 countries, LHC is the largest and most powerful particle accelerator in the world. After an electrical fall initially shut down the collider when it was first turned on in September 2008, it has been operating successfully since November 2009. Um, so, so um, Wagner filed the lawsuit due to his concern that LHC would produce black holes or a strange form of matter that could destroy the Earth. While he attempted to stop the LHC before it began operating, the U.S. court originally dismissed the suit in 2008 on the grounds that the court had no jurisdiction over the LHC operations. Wagner appealed the case, and now for the second time, the court has dismissed the lawsuit for similar reasons. The judge noted that the LHC is owned, managed, and controlled by CERN, not the U.S., the U.S. government enjoys only observer status on CERN Council and has no control over CERN or its operations, the judge wrote in the final decision. Accordingly, the alleged injury destruction of the Earth is in no way attributed to the U.S. government's failure to draft an environmental impact statement. That's a little joke there at the end. Um, not really that funny, but... Anyways, so this was a guy, and quite frankly, he just wasn't big enough to get anything done. Just one guy is not going to be able to do anything against this this company, okay? It's not even going to happen. It's backed by hundreds of countries. So one one little person, you know, you, you need a freaking movement to do something. I mean, seriously. But anyways, it was dismissed. But the reason why I'm pointing this stuff out to you guys is because I want you to see the opposition it's faced over the years and how it's it's so easily just disregards the opposition all right so it's people have felt that this was an unsafe thing um but it it, it just they can't do anything about it it just keeps on moving forward so and um so in uh, june 8th of 2012 cern hits a landmark and i'm pointing this out um because I want you to know that the experiments that they do and the experiments they're doing 
uh, they're growing them. They're, they're getting bigger and bigger. They're up in the ante all the time, right? So in June 2009, and June uh, 9, 2012, this was right before their shutdown. Uh, the accelerator today passed last year's totals and is well on its way. Its goal of delivering 1,500 trillion proton proton collisions in 2012. The new LHC is the LHC is now operating at 1,380 proton bunches per beam. Um, so this is what I found in 2012. It's basically just a benchmark, guys, so you can see um, how many collisions they were doing in 2012. Okay, now. Um, this is before anyone was talking about the Mandela effect, okay? Um, although, I have to admit, when I was thinking about this timeline, and I was thinking about it last night when I went to bed, and I was thinking, like, when was that first Mandela effect about Nelson Mandela? When did people start talking about that one? When was that a, th when was that a thing? Because um, I wonder if there's any correlation between... Um, this first period of CERN operation between 2010 and 2013. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, so that was a benchmark for how much, how many collisions they were doing at the end of their first cycle. Okay. Also at the end of their first cycle before they finally shut down, this was in July, 2012 CERN discovers God particle, right? This is huge on the 4th of July. Um, CERN's Large, Large Hadron Collider announces they have each observed a new particle in the mass region. Um, this particle is consistent with Higgs boson, but it will take further work to determine whether it is the Higgs boson predicted by the standard model. Um, I just want to uh, get on here real quick. I'm not going to read this whole thing to you guys. Guys, I took these notes for myself, uh, but I want to share them with you. Why is the Higgs boson important? Okay, It was the last holdout particle remaining hidden during the quest to check the accuracy of the standard model of physics. This meant its discovery would validate more than a generation of scientific publication. However, here's the important part. Okay, The Higgs is the particle which gives other particles their mass and makes it both centrally important and seemingly magical. We tend to think of mass as an intrinsic property of all things, yet physicists believe that without the Higgs boson, mass fundamentally doesn't exist. Right. So that's why they call it the God particle. All right. And that's why it was its discovery was so important. Um, so in July 2012, they discovered the God particle. Right. Um, now, a few months later, in March of 2013, they, they shut down. It was taken offline and for upgrading. Right. They upgraded it over the course of two years. March 2013. And they were going to bring it back online in 2015. All right. And in that time they were shut down, they were awarded the Nobel Prize. In 2013, October, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded jointly to these two people for theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of the mass of subatomic particles, and which recently was confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle by the Atlas and CMS experiments at CERN's Large, Large Hadron Collider. All right. This is for discovering the God particle. They were awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. All right. Well, let's fast forward to 2015 because the LHC comes back online and testing begins again, right? It was restarted in early 2015 for its second research run. All right. This is a 2015. Now, this is, not no this is notable. This is where things start getting interesting. This was in March of 2015, okay? Now, keep in mind it was upgraded, more collisions, right? And I'll tell you how many more in a, in a, in a minute. But anyways, so in March of, of 2015, it was restarted, and they started running more collisions in March 2015. By August, the Mandela Effect begins to show on trends, Google Trends, right, in a parabolic manner. And let me show you what I mean because I said in a parabolic manner. I mean the curve is going up, right? So if we look at it, let's give it a minute here. There. There we see the first the first curve from Mandela effect right there. People just start trying to figure out what's happening in August of 2015. First little bump, August. So, 
Large Hadron Collider goes back online in March of 2015. March, April, May, June, July, August. A few months later, boom, people start trying to figure out what the hell happened. What the hell's going on? And they start looking into Mandela Effect, trying to figure out what it is. So you see little bumps of it in here. But then it just really just spikes up, and you got to wonder what happened. You know what happened right there. It was five months after they started doing more more collisions in the in the collider. Okay, a few months later, you're gonna see it blow up to the height of its popularity. Okay, but anyways, Mandela effect begins to show on trends. Um, this is interesting too. Um, around the same time, uh, CERN spikes on Google Trends. Okay. And this is what it looks like when you compare them together. There's Mandela Effect, there's CERN. This is Google Trends, you're going to see them spiking together. People are starting to look for answers. Okay, but this is interesting, right? CERN spikes up in interest. CERN spikes up in interest first, right? Right there, September. CERN spikes up in interest right there. Um, but we know CERN went online in March. They started experiments up again in March. But, but um, people had a spike in interest in CERN, a huge spike in interest. Over the past five years, that was the biggest spike in interest right there uh, in CERN. So, it's interesting. It all happens right around the same time. You know, there's a Mandela effect spiking up in August. And then, a month later, CERN spikes up massively, right? And then, boom, 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 up here in August 2016, Mandela effect reaches the height of popularity. And all this stuff is stamped out. Now, see, here's what I'm saying. You guys might think, you guys might think, well, look at this spike in interest in CERN right when the Mandela effect starts the spike, right? But then it dies down. Then it dies down. Why? When the Mandela effect is at its height of popularity, CERN, it wasn't spiked up hardly at all, you know? And, you know, I think that there was definitely some, I can only speak personally, but like I know when I was researching CERN a couple years ago, um, I found a bunch of just stupid information, just fictional stuff that was just stories, people made up stories. You almost kind of wonder if it was misinformation put out there on purpose, but I'm not going to go that far down the conspiracy rabbit hole, so... I'm not going to say that for sure, but I'm just saying this is interesting results. Right when you see it start to spike up, you see a massive interest in CERN, and then it just dies down. Never again to reach that kind of popularity. It's interesting. But all this happens just a few months after they start firing up those collisions again in 2015. So let me just close a couple of these things. So CERN spikes. And this is interesting, okay? CERN spikes 2015, right, on the Google Trends. Now, this is interesting, okay? Also, in 2015, something else very, very important happened, all right? This is the LIGO discovery, all right? The first direct observation of gravitational waves was made on 14th of September 2015 and was announced by the LIGO and Virgo collaborations on 11th of February 2016. It was also the first observation of a binary black hole merger demonstrating the existence of binary stellar mass black hole systems and the fact that such mergers could occur within the current age of the universe. Okay. Um, now, what they're saying is um, binary black hole merger. All right. They're talking about two black holes merging together, right, or colliding together. Right, and it's the first demonstration that the existence of binary stellar mass black holes 
systems and the fact that such mergers could occur within the current age of the universe, right? The, the observation confirms the last remaining directly undetected prediction of the general relativity and co corroborates its predictions of space-time distortion in the context of large-scale cosmic events known as strong field tests. It was also heralded as inaugurating a new era of gravitational wave astronomy, which will enable observations of violent astrophysical events that were not previously possible and potentially allow the direct observation of the very earliest history of the universe. Gravitational waves are disturbances in the curvature or the fabric of space-time generated by accelerated masses that propagate as waves outward from their source at the speed of light. After the initial announcement, the LIGO instrument detect detected two more confirmed and one potential gravitational wave events. They basically discovered gravitational waves. They proved it. I mean, Einstein theorized about gravitational waves, but was never able to actually measure one or see one. LIGO measured one and saw one, all right? And gravitational waves distort space-time. They absolutely cause a disturbance in space-time. All right. Now, another another group of people were interested. Um, now, that was in September 2015. Okay. And August 1st, 2016, Mandela Effect was at the height of its popularity. Right. Everyone was talking about this thing that was happening. Everyone was talking about this thing that was happening. Nobody understood what was going on. It was extremely popular at this time, okay? It's a lot of people misremembering things, okay? In August 2016, there was a lot of people wondering why they couldn't remember things correctly. How popular? That's a blender. That's had tons of advertising on regular TV. It's called the Nutribullet. That's a that was a blender. All right. This had tons of advertising on TV. You know, it's one of those info products you see all the time called the Nutribullet. Right. The Mandela effect was as popular as the damn Nutribullet in 2016. All right. Just for a, a benchmark for you. That's a whole lot of people misremembering, guys. Because nobody, there was no paid advertising for the Mandela effect. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people misremembering, okay? So anyways, it reaches its height of popularity then. Um, this is when it's being talked about the most, all right? Consider this. That was months after gravitational waves were discovered. Um, you know, CERN spiking on Google Trends. It, I mean, it's really getting weird, Okay. And what do you know? In 2017, fast forward several months, 2017, CERN collabs with LIGO, right? What? And, and this uh, this was taken from CERN's website, by the way. Right, this is taken from CERN's website. What do gravitational waves rip from the ripped ripples in the fabric of space time caused by violent energetic processes in the universe have to do with particle physics? At first sight, not much. See, I love how they do that. I love how they do that. They say, oh, this doesn't seem to have anything to do with each other. No, it seems like it would have a lot to do with each other, you know. They're in the business of measuring black holes colliding together, causing uh, gravitational waves that cause disturbances in the fabric of space-time, and you guys are creating miniature black holes. <laughs> I mean, I think there would be a lot. They'd have a lot to do with each other. Anyways, on September 1st, scientists from the gravitational wave community in CERN met to identify technology parallels. <laughs> As CERN works towards a major upgrade of the Large Hadron Collider, because remember, it's shut down at this time. Um, I mean, it's not shut down at this time. It's, it's actually operating. I'm sorry. When they wrote this, it was operating. Um, LIGO is also contemplating major upgrades to current facilities. These will enrich the VISTA of the universe opened up in February 2016 when the laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory LIGO and Virgo collaborations announced 
the long-awaited first detection of gravitational waves, 100 years after their prediction by Einstein's theory of gravity, gravity general relativity. <clears throat> so it goes on to talk about gravitational waves. Um, overall, we had a healthy exchange of ideas that opened the door to the exploration of possible further synergies in joint work. <laughs> so, you know, future collaborations, right? Um, more precise observations of the gravitational fingerprints of the most energetic phenomena of our universe may also help CERN in its quest to understand the fundamental constituents of matter. Collisions of black holes or neuron stars and supernova explosions, for example, could shed light on open questions such as the nature of dark matter, the limits of the val validity of general relativity, and the behavior of matter at extreme densities and pressures. Now keep in mind, guys, they reached out to them after you saw the spikes in Mandela Effect, after you saw the spikes in CERN. I mean, things had happened, all right? Things had happened um, in this time period uh, of collisions. In this time period of collisions between 2012, um, let's see, all right? Things had happened here in this last, uh, this is 2015 when they began again. They shut it down at the end of 2018 for three years. Things happened between 2015 and 2018. Um, you know, it's it's just things things definitely happened here. You know, and I'm not smart enough to connect all the dots. You know, I'm not smart enough with uh, astrophysics, but it's quite obvious that things have happened here in that three year period. I mean, it, it's written all over the place. Anyways, here's another benchmark for you for what, what was going on. Um, October 15, 2018, all right? The integrated luminosity in 2018, the number of collisions likely to be produced during the 2018 run, reached 66 inverse femtobarns, right? Basically, about 13 million billion potential collisions were, to, were delivered to the two experiments, right? That's a lot different than what I told you guys in 2012. All right. Now it's up to 13 quadrillion, 13 million billion collisions. That's 13 quadrillion. So, I mean, it, it was expounded exponentially. Right. It, they, they, up, they upped it exponentially. Those upgrades, they did way more collisions between 2015 and 2018. All right. So it's, it's a bigger deal. OK. Now, um, December 31st, 2018. Um, Large Hadron Collider shuts down again. At the end of 2018, the LHC entered a second two-year shutdown period. Okay. Also, they proposed a new collider, a future collider. Um, this is going to be a $22 billion uh, construction project, but it's going to be way bigger than the LHC, right? It's going to be way bigger. Here's a picture, right? There's the there's the LHC right now. Here's the one they're proposing. It's way bigger, right? It would be more than 60 miles in circumference, cost more than 22 billion dollars. Um, it would be completed around 2050. Be completed around 2050. All right. Um, so, what else? What else can I tell you? Okay. Last thing I want to tell you is in uh, spring of 2021, the LHC will go back online. So what I'm telling you is we're in a period of shutdown for the LHC. So if you're noticing less new Mandela effects um, and less weirdness in the world that you didn't already know about, it might be because this thing is offline right now and it's not doing anything, right? It's scheduled to go back online in, two th in 2021. It's going to be going back online. So if you see an uptick in Mandela effects and you see a bunch of weirdness in the world um, start happening a few months after this thing goes online, you know, I, I don't, I think it's hard to ignore the, co I don't think there's a lot of coincidences. I think it's hard to ignore the parallels. It's very hard to ignore the parallels. Anyway, this video has been really, really long and I feel like it's been very dry. Um, but I hope you guys can see the parallels. I mean, here's some of the questions I have, you know, why, why did all this Mandela effect stuff start a few months after 
um, the LHC goes back online uh, for its second run of experiments, you know, which was way more collisions than the first run of experiments. Why did CERN reach out to LIGO after LIGO discovered gravitational waves produced by black holes when in CERN's safety reports in 2003 and in 2008, they made a point to be dismissive of the micro black holes that the LHC created. They said, oh, those little mini micro black holes are nothing. They'll just evaporate in a few seconds. It's not even worth thinking about. So why, if that was the case, why would they reach out to LIGO? Why would they reach out to LIGO for future collaborations? It doesn't make any sense. Okay. I'm not, I don't, it doesn't take a particle physicist to understand those kind of connections. Um, why is, why is CERN so defensive of their LHC? You know, all the, all the, uh, all the, um, opposition to it over the years that I found, um, constantly just gets smacked down, you know, the scientists get discredited, the lawyers get, you know, the people who aren't scientists, the non-scientists get mocked. They're very, they're, they're very, very aggressive. They're very aggressive in their defense. Anyways, guys, I think that's it for this one. I just wanted to show you the timeline of what I was looking at. Um, some of the connections I made, uh, with CERN, uh, and the Mandela effect and, um, how right now here we are in 2019. And if you're noticing a downtick in Mandela effects, it could very well be because this large Hadron Collider, Hadron Collider is shut down right now and it's not, it's not doing anything. Um, who knows for the future? Who knows? It'll start back up again in 2021. I'll be curious to see if things start going crazy again. If they do, man, that'll leave little doubt in my mind that there's some kind of connection here. Anyways, hope this video finds you all well. I know it's been a dry one, uh, but I hope you can pull some information out of this. I hope it's uh, insightful to you, and I will leave a link to this public timeline uh, so you can reference it for yourself. I'll see you guys. Have a great one. Peace, everybody.